June 7, 1982, the China Everest expedition returns to Seattle. This welcome home celebration marks the end of a three-month journey that has taken some of the best climbers in the country to a part of the world that has been closed to Westerners for nearly half a century. The thrill of being on the world's highest mountain is momentarily forgotten in the reunion with friends and loved ones. We've lived for 70 days without beds, just with a mattress, on the snow and ice. We've been uh, just about three months without showers, or without a toilet. We've cooked all our own meals, and that's why we're so skinny. We've uh, lived in a vertical environment, or near vertical environment. We've been in winds over 100 miles an hour, and an average of 50 and 60 miles an hour almost every day in the month of May, except May 1st. <clears throat> with all the stress and hardships, we lost a team member in a tragic accident on top of the mountain. A week before the team's departure, a thank you party was given for those who had done so much to make the expedition possible. For two years, the team had worked with these people to assemble five tons of equipment, a three-month food supply, and the $300,000 that was needed. With this task completed, there was time to talk about the mountain. We will be the first team to climb the north side of Everest, primarily, I think, because it's just been open. I'm sure everybody will lose some weight. That's inevitable, but, but hopefully we can avoid losing, you know, 30, 40 pounds, that kind of stuff. Interestingly enough, uh, you don't need anything special. There's no wonder food that you take. That's the thing about climbing. You're right down to basics. It's just eating, sleeping, and working. And you got to have shelter, and if it isn't there, if the food isn't right, all those things... <laughs> Everest will never be like this. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> How long are we going to stay in Laza? Laza will be a three-day... Lou Whitaker's backyard is a popular gathering place. Some of the expedition members who have been climbing with him for years are like an extended family. We fly, right? And from there, we go to 16,000. We go too fast, we will be hurting. The longer we stay in Laza, the more money we spend because it costs... $200 a day per person yeah. to spend a night in Laza. Yeah. So, so we'd like to limit it to two days. They have suggested three days in Laza. They, what they did promise us was as soon as we hit China, in 10 days we will be at the end of the road ready to start hiking. As the team explores Peking, they are struck by the contrast of a country struggling to change its direction. The subdued dress and regimentation of its people seem out of place amid the wondrous architecture that mirror the 40 centuries of rich culture that has gone before. Uh, two space, one is outer, outer place and the other is inner place. For inner place, it's just the living quarters, and for outer place, uh, it's the place for something. The Forbidden City, built during the Ming Dynasty. This glorious structure was, for centuries, the sacred precinct of the ancient rulers of China. Today, it is the People's Museum.
great wall of china one of the seven wonders of the world a giant earth and stone structure that has a length of nearly four thousand miles fascination of seeing a part of the world that has been closed to Westerners for two decades is great, and the feeling is mutual. As they depart on a two-day train ride to the city of Chengdu, their thoughts return again and again to Everest. Okay, then one, two, see then the six is about right here. dreamt about those rolling brown plains and the city of Lhasa, and we've all read about them from our youngest ages. So when, when Tibet and China opened up, boy, that, that's the plum. They're, they're, anybody would go there, even not to climb a mountain, and then if you could climb a mountain too, that's frosting on the cake. The team leader and main force behind the China Everest climb is Lou Whitaker. The Whitaker name is well known in international climbing circles. Mountaineering is his life. He lives at the foot of Mount Rainier and operates the Rainier Mountaineering Guide Service. Each spring, climbers from across the U.S. travel to Mount Rainier to try out for a position with a guide service, the most prestigious in the country. A little talk and a lot of practical is what you want. Yes! Oh, oh, beautiful! We need a rope on All right, you need to stop. Let's finish it. Who knows? You might have someone else on your rope who's in the process of falling. The train ride gave the team a chance to sample the local fare. Their opinions were as mixed as the menu. One of the first team members slated for the climb was Marty Hui, the only woman on the expedition. I'm going to try, I hope to be, the first American female to climb Everest. I hope that I'm strong enough uh, to even have the chance, and when it presents itself, I will hopefully be ready. I think an interesting aspect to this climb that, as a guide, I think about or wonder about frequently, and that's the difference between what makes a good mountaineer or a good climber and a good guide. Most of the people on this climb are guides or have been in the past. I don't think it's going to be a problem, but it's going to, you're going to be putting people in a very a different position than we're kind of used to, because as guides, you are in a, you are in a leadership capacity, and uh, we're all used to doing that. Um, and I, you know, I think Lou is a strong leader and will probably be able to, uh, you know, amend any problems along those lines that arise. But I think it's going to be uh, very interesting for everybody as an individual to just go as a climber uh, instead of a guide. Ten years earlier, she had been a cook for the guide service and had risen from there to become one of the foremost climbers in the country. I think... It's the challenge of it. I, you're continually putting yourself in a situation where you maybe have to call on you know, a lot of other qualities that, that you can't read about in books and that you uh, can't go to school for, that you can't really train for. You're dealing with very basic things. I mean, it's one foot in front of the other, and you either are capable of doing that or you aren't. I think that 
if I am physically and mentally prepared that I'll have a chance and but I have no idea how that chance will present itself I think the mountain will determine who will be ready to climb Two members of the team who come from outside the professional climbing circle are Frank Wells, vice chairman of Warner Brothers, and Dick Bass, businessman and ski resort developer. At my age in life, climbing a mountain presents me with a capsulated opportunity to arrive at a tangible uh, moment of success. And so much of my life is wrapped up in working in businesses that have very long evolutionary uh, lives to them. And when you're involved in that many long range projects, you get very frustrated. And I have found recently now that climbing the mountains gives me an opportunity in a short period of time to achieve a goal I set out to do. The oldest climber and lifetime outdoorsman is Dave Mare, 54. He's the father of nine children, including ski champions Phil and Steve Mare. After raising his family, he is finally realizing a lifelong dream. When I was younger, I was torn always between what I wanted to do climbing and what I what my responsibilities were in life. The thing about climbing is that it's it's so uplifting. You realize how small and insignificant that man is. Uh, uh, you just I think you just have a better feeling for your fellow man and a, a bigger awareness of of everything that's around you. Uh, the grass is greener and the sky's bluer and. Everything just means a uh, whale of a lot more to me. The remote kingdom of Tibet can only be reached with any certainty by plane. The road, built by the Chinese, is only passable certain times of the year. Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, at an elevation of 12,500 feet and surrounded by rugged mountains, it is the most isolated city in the world. was occupied by the Chinese in 1950. The harsh repression that followed forced their spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, to leave the country. Only recently has the stoic resistance of the fiercely independent Tibetans brought about a relaxation of control. Lhasa is the religious heart of Tibet. Practicing an intense form of Buddhism, followers will journey at least once in their lives to God's place to worship, some prostrating themselves every several paces along the way.
After three days in Lhasa, the final leg of their journey takes them over the ancient dusty trails of Tibet to Rongbuk Glacier, the end of the road. Veteran climber Jim Wickwar. He successfully climbed K2, the world's second highest mountain, in 1978. Why does one climb? Uh, is going on a major Himalayan peak justified when you've got a wife and five children, a law practice, uh, and many, many people that, that care about your safety? I think we sometimes, particularly those of us who live in the cities, uh, we tend to forget what the rest of the world is like. And I think when you get out in the mountains, uh, there's the great natural beauty that, that surrounds you. Also, I, I think just the challenge that any mountain provides, uh, it's being able to meet that challenge. Uh, and I think you're, you're overcoming fears about being in a, a dangerous place, fears about the, the threat that the mountains have, uh, whether it's Rainier or a K2 or an Everest. There's an ice cliff up there that may avalanche, a uh, rock fall may come down. But being able to, to get through that kind of an experience, I think, gives you a, a tremendous sense of satisfaction. There's a long-term psychological benefit. The expedition has to be entirely self-sustainable. And just moving that much equipment and supplies across areas that are frequently where there are no roads. So sometimes the hike into the mountain could be over 100 miles just to reach the base of the mountain. As they near Road's End, they see for the first time the reason for their journey. Chomolungma, goddess of mountains, Everest. As the wind slices a crystal shroud from its icy shoulders, they stop to gaze on the mountain and have a private moment of thought. Road's End, Rongbuk Glacier, 16,900 feet. Here, supplies are transferred to yaks, the strange, resilient beast of burden in the Himalayas. The climbers must adjust to altitude, and on the higher peaks, and particularly the 8,000-meter peaks, you must wait at the lower elevations to adjust to the altitude. And it's, uh, if you try to rush up the mountain uh, too fast before you acclimatize, you run into problems of uh, high altitude mountain sickness. At 18,400 feet, supplies are unloaded and advanced base camp is established. It is at this point that the team's path crosses that of a British expedition led by premier climber, Chris Bonington. This is Chris Bonington, everybody. Hi, hello, my goodness. The visiting head of state. All right, welcome, welcome. Bonington's group, attempting an untried route on the East Ridge, will be mounting an alpine-style climb, a quick assault and retreat, using only six climbers. Well, with all six feet of units, you'll be warm. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Tusker. Tusker? Like the opera? Uh, what is it? What is it? Tusker. Oh, Tusker. Oh, I see. It's Tusker. I see. You say Tusker. I got you. Hi, uh, Charles. Four miles back up. Just fine. You don't like it. Really recovering. No. It is. It is a little hot. Oh, terrific. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Chris. How far is it? That's a week ago. With advanced base camp established, they turn their full attention to the mountain. Because this is an untried route, 
there is no information from previous climbs they can rely on. They must plot their course by observing from below and by scouting to determine the route of the climb and the position of the higher camps. We had 17 in our expedition. Uh, we did not use Sherpa or Tibetan uh, porters. That's only been done once before on Everest uh, by a large expedition. It was a New Zealand expedition that was trying it from the Nepalese side. They did not succeed. So we were the second expedition that was attempting to climb the mountain without that kind of help. So we justified the size of our team because we weren't going to have that kind of support. It's, it's a much more satisfying experience when you're relying totally on your own resources. In early April, Camp 1 is established at 18,800 feet. While scouting continues for a location for Camp 2, the rest of the team begins the enormous daily task of sorting and carrying load after load of supplies and equipment up the mountain. The site for Camp 2 is located at 20,300 feet at the foot of the mountain. It's April 3rd and we've got Camp 2 established. It's about a two to three hour walk from Camp 1. It's a pretty good sled pole, but so for that last 30, 40 minutes up that, that one hill is kind of a kind of a gut pull. This camp will serve as the principal base of operation. But uh, I think this is gonna be a real excellent campsite, as long as we don't get too much snow. Uh, we're surrounded on three sides. Uh, the north face of Everest, the south face of Chansey, and the, the north coal. If it starts snowing in here, uh, we could get a real high avalanche hazard. That, uh, we think we've picked the one spot in this whole cirque, this whole basin, where we think if everything avalanched that it would stop short of this particular campsite. But I believe if it does, if it does snow heavily, I don't think anybody's going to be in this vicinity to wait to find out if it it does stop short of this campsite. What we're going to do is start work on the route to Camp 3. If you go this way, you got all that rock fall from up above coming down. Yeah. I think once you get on Camp 3, man, it's it's a straight shot to Camp 4 and then another straight up to, to 5. Yeah. I think that the biggest hazard, though, is getting here and 3. Yeah, four will you be know, that really might be worthwhile to go up on that big check. Four will be but a long day, but I don't think it's going to be a sneak chance. You can see where all the dirt oh, has yeah, come I down. Oh, yeah, I can We're never going to be able to eliminate the accidents that occur in mountaineering or the fatalities. Equipment in 1982 should not fail. 
if the team has done a reasonably good job of choosing the gear and maintaining the gear throughout the expedition. There's no reason for a major equipment failure to cause injuries and deaths. Human error is, is always going to exist as far as mountaineering accidents are concerned. Everyone on the expedition carried day in and day out, and early stages of the expedition we felt like uh, mules or donkeys because there was just so much load carrying that went on. Uh, you would carry a load 10, 12 days in a row and maybe then get a rest day. Three was easy because three was essentially a walk from Camp 2. We thought this was going to be the most technical section of the route, but due to the avalanche hazard down low, we felt it would be better to go around onto Chanxi to reach the 22,000 foot level. Camp 3 is finally established at 22,300 feet. As each higher camp is established, supplies are brought up. The plan is to cycle the teams in waves up the mountain. While the first team tries for the summit, another team will move up into position, while a third team rests below. If the summit team fails, they will return to a lower camp, rest, then move up into position again. But you, went around the corner you don't realize how many little things you take for granted until you get up in the mountain, like changing your shorts or going to the bathroom. You have to be tolerant, you know, when you're living this close to people for this long. Without showers or any way to wash, your nose in particular has to be tolerant. Camp 3 is reinforced and two more tents are added. Deep snow and ice face above Camp 3 necessitates the use of fixed ropes. And this was the first time that we were on steep snow and ice, putting in ice screws and pickets and fixed ropes above Camp 3. So that is a slow process and takes several days of lead climbing to get the route in. Going from Camp 3 to Camp 4, uh, we went beyond the Camp 4 site because we, weren't, we were looking for a better campsite and couldn't find any higher up, so ended up coming back down. And in four days of climbing above Camp 3, we were able to put the fixed ropes in.
Camp 4 was expected to be higher on the mountain. Because of the difficult terrain, it is established only 1,400 feet above Camp 3 at 23,700 feet. It becomes clear to the team that not five, but six camps will be needed. The distances the team can cover become shorter. Because the body doesn't absorb nutrition properly at this altitude, endurance is limited. A daily intake of 6,000 calories and six quarts of water are necessary to prevent muscle deterioration. The climbers must frequently descend to below the 20,000 foot level to diminish the effects of altitude and intense cold. Oxygen is added to the list of provisions to be carried to the high camps. I think uh, Everest may be the only mountain in the world on which oxygen is, is really truly justifiable in that even though it's been done now a couple times without it, there's nothing wrong with oxygen. but. To do it without, it just makes it that much more appealing. I think the chief uh, help is to have the warmth that the oxygen gives you. When you're lacking oxygen at high altitude, there's just a shutting down of, of uh, circulation and warmth out to those extremities uh, at the extreme elevations and when it's as cold as it was on Everest. It's very difficult to get moving in the morning. It takes you two or three hours to get through the breakfast and just get clothes on and get the crampons and roped up and ready to go. And there were several mornings we started that process at seven o'clock, six or seven in the morning, and we wouldn't get out till nine or 10. Other mornings, people sometimes didn't get away until 11. And then you uh, work till quite late in the afternoon. And there were instances when people came down to the camps in the dark. I once heard uh, the reason that more Americans don't make the summits on Himalayan climbs is that they're too damn democratic. I think the, the larger the expedition, the more difficult are the problems of leadership in terms of uh, it's easy when you have a group of four or six people. You almost don't have a leader. It's, it's very, it can be very democratic. Decisions can be reached on a consensus basis. But as the expedition increases in size and reaches the size of ours, uh, the leader has to have authority to make decisions. They have to take into account people's wishes, people's concerns. And I think one of the things that Lou did very well was to, to talk to people on a regular basis, shared with them what was going through his mind and how he was seeing the expedition unfold. With Camp 5 established, the first summit team is selected. They cover final details for Camp 6 and the first summit attempt. To get the most out of a team like this team is to give them as much of their uh, freedom as possible, uh, each of them must have a certain amount of leading and uh, free time on a new route on that mountain. So with that basic thought, uh, the selection of who goes up the mountain had to be a little bit, uh, a little bit carefully done so that all of them had the feeling and the right to go up and lead a section. Take the warmest, take every warm thing you got. We should talk about what goes to six, maybe. Does, do food bags go to six? Remember we talked about that then, that it probably wasn't real necessary. That people I could agree. Win, win, I agree. Because when you go to six, you, you should are, pick out what you want. And you're an and anyway, you want, so your, you want your stove? You want stove, stove oxygen, yeah. oxygen. Oxygen, that's, that's it. it. 
one oxygen bottle went to five this morning. Already? <laughs> I mean, that's an that's huh. approachable. Uh, that that's approachable to the upper mountain if you've got oxygen that far. Camp five was established at 25,000 feet, with camp six to be placed at about 26,500 feet. With Frank Wells breaking trail and Dave Mayer supporting them, the first summit team, Marty Hoy, Larry Nielsen, and Jim Wickwire, prepare to move up the mountain. I think everyone who goes to those mountains knows the risk. And the risk really is one of altitude. When you get up that high, your judgment is impaired. And most of the fatalities occur as a result of, of mental errors. Word from the summit team is overdue. The anxiety that something has gone wrong grows as the hours pass. A radio transmission at the end of the day confirms their worst fears. A camera carried by a team member records the last moments before the tragedy. Dave and Larry were about 150 feet above looking for a site for Camp 6. Uh, the weather was deteriorating. Uh, we could see them only intermittently through the swirling mists. Uh, we heard a call down from Dave for more rope. And just as I was beginning to move to put my pack on, Marty said, uh, let me get out of your way. And I looked up and could see that she had, was falling backwards down the slope. She was falling head first on her back. She rolled to one side and made a try for the rope, but could grab a hold of it. Her ice axe and empty harness still attached to the fixed rope are the only indication of Marty's presence on the mountain only seconds before. For some unexplained reason, her waist harness had come loose. After the rage came the disappointment and the sadness. And it was pretty lonely we sat there and uh, questioned whether, whether mountaineering was something that uh, some of us would follow in the future even. And then uh, said, well, let's get to bed and we'll see what the decision is in the morning. The following day, Wickwire, badly shaken, is accompanied down the mountain by Dave Mayer. A search team determines that Marty's body cannot be recovered. Larry Nielsen, the remaining member of the first summit team, does not come down following Marty's death. Nielsen stays high on the mountain at Camp 5. He is joined by the second summit team, George Dunn and Eric Simonson. The next morning, the three climbers start for the summit. Above Camp 6, a knee injury from a falling rock prevents Simonson from going further. Nielsen still feels he can reach the summit, 
and continues up the mountain alone. I personally felt extremely strong and I'm sure part of that was the idea of going to the summit. I'm sure I had some adrenaline pumping through my body a little bit. And I continued up to uh, 27,500. I got to a ledge and I looked out. There's nothing higher, anything that I could see. And I looked up at what I had left. I started thinking of my family. And that was really the turning point, I think. I, I calculated that the chances of falling were fairly good. And uh, I decided that I better come down. In total darkness, he feels his way down the fixed ropes, 4,200 feet to Camp 3. Nielsen's hands and feet are severely frostbitten. With the realization that for him the climb is over, he passes Chris Karabrock's classical horn mouthpiece to Jim Wickwire. Karabrock, who had originally conceived this expedition, lost his life in an accident on Mount McKinley during a conditioning climb with Wickwire. As he lay dying, he had asked that the mouthpiece be placed at the summit of Everest. Time is running out, food is in short supply, and the monsoon season is setting in. On May 24th, the slight break in the weather gives them their final chance for the summer. Larry Nielsen's condition worsens, and he must be evacuated to base camp by remaining team members. With the knowledge that the British summit attempt has fallen short and cost two lives, Whitaker anxiously monitors his own team when they encounter severe weather at 24,000 feet. Looking for just a little more. Tell me what the weather's doing here, over. Okay, uh, Jim's taking a photograph right now. Uh, Gio, how are you feeling? Well, I'll tell you, Lou, I'm a little run down. Uh, I think I need a little more rest after that last attempt. I feel pretty good. You know, I can always keep up. I think the weather is just really shitty, though. I, I don't see how we have a chance. The situation becomes critical as the storm closes in. Jim, I made a decision down here that I can live with real easy and uh, be real happy with. I hope you make the same one up there. The decision's probably easy to make, it's just that we all feel so goddamn much effort has gone into this thing. We also want to all come back alive. We've already lost to one dear person. Over. <clears throat> Your choice, whatever it is, is my choice. We'll, uh, we'll turn our backs on the summer of the Harbor Mountain. Knowing that 17 gave it its best. Good, Jim. I appreciate it very much. God damn it. The dream of reaching the top is over. But there is also a feeling of relief that the struggle on the highest part of the mountain has come to an end. Oh, 
Unable to walk, Nielsen is carried down in an improvised litter where he is transferred to a yak. Before leaving their final camp, team members build a memorial cairn to Marty, facing the mountains she had loved. We lost Marty, we lost a lot of our spirit, a lot of our goal. And Marty will always be remembered as a, as a beautiful young person. She left us that way. And uh, as long as we live, all of us will age and, and sicken. Marty will remain healthy and in our minds just how she was on this climb, a very strong, alive woman who, to us, gave our team the spirit and cohesiveness that it needed. And we'll always think of Everest and think of Marty as well. Compared to all of you who knew her so well, I sort of felt like an outsider at first. You haven't made me feel that way after the three months we've been together. But the thing I will always remember about Marty is it was unfailing whenever I came back from a carry or climbing from one camp to another and she was there and I'll always remember her with that smile when I came into camp. The most important thing in life is not the triumph but the struggle. The essential thing is not to have conquered but to have fought well. To spread these precepts is to build up a more valiant and above all more scrupulous and more generous humanity. Phil Erschler summarizes the feelings of his teammates. You spend three months of your life, travel halfway around the world, play havoc with your health, lose maybe one of the best friends you've ever had, and you can't help eventually but sit down at some time and, and contemplate, was it worth it? Would I do it again? I guess most people just plumb say you're crazy, but I think all of us would do it again without much hesitation at all. The price was a big one to pay, but anybody that's had the opportunity to, to climb in a range like the Himalaya has got an idea what I'm talking about when I say there's just nothing like being up there. I know Marty would come back if she had the opportunity. If she had to go, then I guess this is a place that Marty would like to be. Being in that environment and being exposed to the things that all mountaineers feel when they're up high is what we keep going back for. And so they came, and like others before them and others who will follow, they are people who allow their curiosity, reckoning, and will to carry them naturally to that balancing point between what is possible and what is not.